that lends a lot of credibility. You know, if you come in and can be upfront and honest and say, you know, actually in this application, I think this product over here that I don't represent would be better for you. That all of a sudden now you become a trusted advisor rather than a salesman. And, you know, I often say that we have uh, all the requirements of space, right? Because it has to go underground and send us data from, from miles and miles away. And it has to work like failure is not an option. Uh, we'll put on, you know, a standard meal shoe. Ours is slightly different just for that, but it's, you know, everybody's got one. The top drive and the drawers really don't care whether the electrons coming at it are from a joystick or a PLC. The, the pen and what you see here on the left, which is uh, now controlled by uh, one of my students, uh, is showing you actually uh, the control of our brakes. As of now, geothermal is a pretty small, pretty small market. If you have torch velocity, the, uh, the casing will be up against the side on part of the well. There won't be any cement there. The cement will have crescent around it. So managed pressure drilling, it's been defined as a process to precisely control the pressure profile in the well bore. The key is being transparent with our clients in, in this case. So tell them what happened. If we had a failure, tell them exactly what happened. It, whether it's our fault, whether it's what, whatever the issue was, we need to be transparent. But I think it's very important for everyone in the industry to know what's out there and kind of what's happening down hole as well. I've probably worked on over 40 different performance limiters in my career. If I miss any of those and a computer is raising weight on bit and I miss any of those, I have a train wreck. The computer's going in the ocean. Here's your new colors, here's your new thing. Don't do here's that. Here's the all. tattoo you need to get. Yeah, here's the tattoo. Sorry about the last one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we used to fake that all the time. <laughs>
my cousin, I love you, business partner, tuning in from San Antonio. Hope it's a wonderful show. Hopefully, you get to learn something today because uh, I know I will be. So, hopefully, it's an educational one for uh, my cousin Daniel and business partner as well. Uh, uh, tuning in for so P Pushkar. Hopefully, I got that right. Thanks for tuning in all the way from India. Lots of people in India. What time is it there right now? I know they've got like India's got like the thirty minute time zone, so it's not on the hour. It's 30 minutes shifted. I think that's India's central time zone. I don't know. All right. James Robson tuning in from El Paso. Uh, Alphonse from Indonesia. Wow, it's got to be even later there. Um, maybe it's not late. Maybe it's early. Is that? I don't know. Maybe. I, well, I don't know. All right. Anyways, uh, Baggio tuning in from India. In, in. Wait, did we already do? I think we did that one twice. Oh, gosh. Oh, lost my place now. Whitney, tuning in from Richmond, Texas. Thanks for being here. Brent, hey, if y'all are looking to hire somebody, this is the cat right here. Give him a shout. Uh, Scott, tuning in from Scott, sunny Scotland. Scott's company, uh, Agile Tech, they're going to be a part of the Managed Pressure Drilling event. So glad that they're uh, he's here tuning in with us. James Robertson, keep on keeping on. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Uh, once again, from India. And everybody's saying in at the end of it. Is that like a LinkedIn thing or something? Oh, my LinkedIn's not even updating. I don't even see what's going on over here. All right, John DeWart, tuned in from Colorado. See, John's watching on YouTube because I think when he tunes in from LinkedIn, it says LinkedIn user. Still haven't seen our LinkedIn user yet. Um, Miles, uh, David from Colombia, Rado from Austin. Thank you so much for lunch yesterday, sir. I really do appreciate it. We got to do it again before you leave town. Uh, then we've got... James Robertson, first time here. Thanks. Turkey. Mark from Houston. Bajo in India. Oh, it's 15 past nine. So, fifth, wait, 15? Wow, well, I don't know. Okay. I'm, time zones are not the thing for me. All right. Uh, Rihat from Tunisia. Leroy, thank you so much for being here. He's, he's become one of like the ultimate fans of the show. He's always tuning in. Uh, Keith Late, thanks. Gosh, actually, he said he was traveling, so that's okay. If he hopefully he's practicing safe traveling procedures, and his wife Erin is the one who's putting this in. All right, uh, Michael says first time here. Well, Michael, thank you for tuning in. Uh, he was on the Pay It Forward Friday by Keith's post today, so everybody reach out and uh, connect with Michael. John Ward says that's right. I can't, still can't figure out how to get LinkedIn to show my name. Well, if LinkedIn can't do it, YouTube can. All right, if you guys are watching on YouTube and you really like this, if you do, you can actually put a little like, if you've got a question and it's not getting answered or something, you can put like, you could donate a dollar ninety nine or something like that to the show. It's like a super sticker thing. It's one of those like YouTuber things to be able to help them. But if you wanna use it for the show, hey, I'm not gonna stop you. If you like the show, feel free to. All right, uh, former guest, Todd Brooker, thanks for being here, sir. And then we've got Jared tuning in from Houston. Thank you guys so much for being here. All right. <clears throat> um, we started this a long time ago. First with Fahim, then with Keith. And now with the absolutely amazing Andrea Switzer is going to come on and give us a minute with uh, her. Um, so, oh, and then Chris Chatar from uh, tuning in from California. Thanks for being here. All right. Let me get the thing pulled up. And I made this whole, oh, crap. I forgot to, I got to take this thing off. Otherwise it stays up there. <clears throat> Totally made fun of me, but I made this in less than 10 minutes from, from being heckled to being produced and ready for the show. This is your minute with Andrea. Good morning. It's so great to be back on the show. <laughs> Thank you for all of your comments and questions last week regarding collaboration between drilling and subsurface teams. In that spirit, my impact story this week is about just that multidisciplinary cooperation to improve the well's economic performance. When I joined a new asset team in the Houston region, I took time to meet my new teammates, trying to understand the history of development in the field, as well as their current challenges. From those conversations, I learned that the placement, um, the past placement of the ESPs in the well bore um, was too high to effectively produce the well. Uh, and they needed to be moved within a couple hundred feet of the reservoir. 
This posed a significant challenge as drilling a curve on TENS is about 600 feet TBD and an ESP cannot operate in the high dog-like severity regions of the curve. What could we do? The curve, uh, the solution was to split the curve into a build in, uh, to about 65 degrees, hold a tangent for about 200 feet, and to build again to, to land and drill the horizontal. Was splitting a curve conventional? Was it easy? Did it, did it make drilling performance super awesome? No. But the multidisciplinary asset team's job is to, to deliver, um, to deliver economically producing wells for the company, not just really awesome days versus depth curve. So I invite you this week to reach out to your asset team members and figure out what challenges that they're facing that you can help with and to deliver um, elevated performance as a team together. And that was your minute with Andrew. Wasn't that intro absolutely amazing? I think everybody loves it. Andrea laughed at me for it, but that's okay. I'm used to people laughing at me. Everything's going quite swimmingly so far. All right, guys uh, and gals, uh, now's the time to be able to do something kind of fun, which I probably should just wait till the very end of the show for the people that actually tune around the entire time. Uh, but um, we're gonna try this once again. This is, I think, the second week, third week in a row trying this. Let me grab something from over here without having to bring everything down. And my camera stays in focus. I don't know what the deal is. My, I'm back on autofocus and it's working quite well. All right, um, this is not the one that we will be giving away because uh, this one's actually, wow, the orange here versus what I see on camera is not quite the same. It's not as bright. Uh, anyways, let's give away a little 3D printed drill bit. Uh, all you got to do is put into the comment section, hashtag Gibson, which looks like this. Don't capitalize the G. Listen, do not capitalize the G. This right here. Looks like me doing this. So hashtag Gibson in the comment section, and then we'll draw a name. And then you guys can be the fabulous one to look at one of these. All right, if you're a sponsor and you're watching the show, or if you want to be a sponsor for the show and you want to say, instead of it saying Gibson, you want to say, have it say your name, you know, directional X, Y, Z, or whomever, that's more than possible. All right. So put that in there, guys. Let's see if we get a, a, a ah, hit the wrong button. Oops, hold on guys. Y'all keep doing it. I screwed up. Oh. Hold on. Hold on. Keep making your comments. It's still working. I made the wrong one. Okay, guys. Uh, all right. So once we let's let it get over 25 and then we'll bring it up there and we'll get it working. All right. Put the banner, put the brand, take that one back off. Okay. We're almost there. Almost there. It's going good. So that was probably the technical script that I hit the wrong button. All right. So do, 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 do. Come on. Come on, guys. We need one more entry. Straight. So hashtag Gibson. That's all you got to do. Just like that. Not with the, not the, oops. Don't do the capital G. Do lowercase g. For some reason, if you don't win, don't win it, John. I'll print a bit off of my office and send it for you. <laughs> All right, let's try this one more time. All right, now I got to put this actually up on the screen. And we've got 26 inches. Good enough. Here we go. All right, throw this up on the screen and then hit draw again. There we go. Now it's working. Let's see who the lucky winner is. I'm betting I'm sending one of these bad boys internationally. And great. Greg Deaton, you are the winner. Send me a uh, link and we'll get you, uh, have one of these sent over to you. Thanks for watching, Greg. Do appreciate it. This little tool is fun. I don't really like it. We should probably end up doing a whole bunch of these. All right. Take that back off the screen and we'll just go ahead and bring in our guest of the day. Guest of the day is Aaron Burton. Aaron, thank you for being here, sir. Oh, thank you for having me, David. Great to be here. I 
I don't mean to, but I think I hit right at 15 minutes every time with being able to hit, hit getting the start of the show with it with the guests. But man, all right, Sorry, so Aaron, I feel like, I feel like you're a good hype man there. So <laughs> everybody needs a hype man. Everybody needs a hype yes. man, and I am happy to be yours today, sir. Uh, so for people who don't know who you are, uh, give us a quick quick background of who you are, and then we'll get right into your presentation, sir. Yeah, so uh, so I, I'm uh, Aaron Burton. I've uh, been in the industry now, coming up on 14 years pretty quick. Uh, graduated mechanical engineer, uh, small town Mississippi. Uh, when I came into the industry, I had spindle top in my head, right? Poke a hole in the ground and you just got to catch the oil. Uh, obviously, it's a little bit more difficult than that. Uh, started with Baker Hughes, uh, offshore Lafayette. Gulf of Mexico was healthy at the time, prima condo, but uh, Q4 of 2007, I'm bored, sweeping the shop floor five times a day, pestering all the coordinators. Uh, trying to get some kind of something going uh, besides shop floor sweeping. So I called my boss and said, come on, somebody somewhere needs a set of hands. So uh, we ended up coming to Houston, starting to build frack sleeves that are used in these types of applications. And next thing I knew, I was one of uh, just a few people uh, in all of Baker Hughes who knew how to build the sleeves. So I started teaching people how to build the sleeves, started running them in the field, learning how to run them in the field. And then kind of bounced around all over. Um, so bounced all over the U.S. plays uh, in, in 2008. At least to my knowledge, I was one of the first people that ran them outside of North America. I ran two jobs in China and uh, then held a couple of different roles uh, throughout with um, <clears throat> throughout the U.S. with um, application engineering, ops coordinator, things like that. And then I uh, did business development, product line, things like that throughout my the rest of my career at Baker. And in 2015, I was laid off and I uh, got to think about what I wanted to do and uh, always wanted to have my own business. So decided to give it a go and uh, just actually uh, just hit over six years now. So been on my own independent now doing training and consulting on these multi-stage completions for hydraulic fracturing. So. Excellent. All right. Quick update. Uh, Azar, we're done with the draw. You don't have to keep putting in Gibson anymore. We're, we're, I think he's got it on a, on a, a robot or something. We don't, you don't have to keep doing it anymore. But. Okay. All right, so I'll go ahead and pull up your presentation. Okay. You guys have any questions about uh, multi-stage fracturing and unconventionals, or I mean, I guess it could be using conventionals so either way, but if you've got some questions, be sure to throw them out there and okay. we'll start firing them off to Aaron. So here you go. All right, you can see my screen, hear me still? Yes, sir. Perfect. Yeah, so uh, so I think this is actually going to be a really good presentation. I, I know, David, that a lot of your audience is drilling, um, and, and I think this kind of ties in nicely with what Andrea is doing as far as kind of linking everything together. So at the end, I'm going to, uh, you know, throughout, I'm going to try to put the twist uh, as far as the drilling, uh, how it relates to completions, and then uh, also, you know, why it's very important to correlate uh, drilling completions and production as well. So overall, I think this will be a great um, uh, segment for your audience there. So. Uh, so yeah, uh, if you, you know, we're limited on time here, but uh, if you want to know more information on these types of subjects, you can check out my website, UOG training. And if you're tuning in from YouTube, you can always so subscribe to my YouTube channel. So, so just wanted to kind of start with some of the basics, setting up these types of reservoirs. What are we doing? And with these unconventional reservoirs, uh, they're often referred to as shales. Uh, but the reality is, is in a lot of cases, they're not shales. So this is the uh, definition of shale from geology.com. I won't read it to you, but long story short, it's just a type of rock. So, so when people are talking shale, um, a lot of times it's used slangly uh, throughout the industry uh, as, as these unconventional plays. So when people are referring to these shale plays, they're referring to a low permeability formation. It's a consolidated formation. So you don't have to worry about things like sand control and things like that that you would in conventional applications. And they can be shells by all means, but they also can be sandstones, carbonates, dolomites, uh, whatever the case may be. And really, at the end of the day, what people are referring to when they talk about these shale plays, it's really a reservoir that requires multi-stage hydraulic fracturing to be able to produce at economical rates. So the name of the game in these types of plays is increasing the reservoir contact. So, um, so these are relatively thin reservoirs. Uh, just to kind of give you a, a frame of reference, if you're talking about the U.S. plays, they typically range anywhere from uh, 25 feet thick to 500 feet thick, um, 500 normally being the max in most of the U.S. plays. 
So uh, we can drill a vertical in those targeted reservoirs. Uh, and let's just use that 500 foot thick. So we can drill that vertical well, we can get contact area with it. But if we take that well, kick it sideways, now, uh, you know, drill it sideways 5,000, 10,000 feet, 15,000 feet maybe. Uh, now we're really significantly creating or increasing the contact area in that target reservoir. Now it's the same concept with the multi-stage hydraulic fracturing. So if we apply uh, multi-stage uh, hydraulic fracturing to the vertical well, we do increase the surface area that we're contacting. But if we take that horizontal well and now put 30, 40, 50 individual stages, now we've really started to increase the reservoir contact area. Now, technically, um, at least on paper, horizontal wells are not necessarily a requirement. Uh, however, uh, everything I've seen, I, I think the industry has mostly agreed on this. Uh, they pretty much are a requirement. So you take the <clears throat> you take the Vaca Marta in Argentina, certain sections of it can be up to 5,000 feet thick. So the one of the initial thoughts was a vertical well development could be done uh, because it's cheaper to do, it's faster, everything else. But then after they got to doing fracturing with those vertical wells, they realized that they just really couldn't get good distribution of fractures because of the different properties throughout the zones in that formation. So even in the thicker areas throughout the uh, throughout the world, it does appear that horizontal frac uh, horizontal wells will actually end up being a requirement. So why are the multi-stage completions required? And the simple thing is the fractures will go to the path of least resistance. And there's a lot of different reasons why you have those paths. You have drilling stresses, drilling damage, friction loss, and of course, formation weakness. So if you don't um, <clears throat> divvy up the well into stages, this is what your uh, frag job may look like, where uh, most of your treatment goes to the path of least resistance and the rest of the lateral gets little or no treatment. And that's why we divide the well into different compartments called stages. So now we've got path of least resistance within that stage. So we, we divide that well up and uh, distribute that fracture throughout the lateral. <clears throat> so with our fracture treatment, <clears throat> so um, if you're not familiar or too familiar with the um, uh, components of the frac job, uh, don't worry too much about the mechanics yet. I think you'll pretty much understand it once this presentation is over. But what we're looking at here, of course, is the targeted reservoir. We've got our light, uh, light gray here. That's the casing string. The dark gray is our cement. And then we already have a perforation applied. So we we perforated through the casing, through the cement, and now we have access to our target reservoir. So we apply um, our hydraulic frac job, the pressure cracks the rock, and then we put propent in to hold that fracture open. Now, if we zoom in a little bit further, uh, once we apply the pressure, that rock is going to crack, and the initial uh, stage of the frac job is called the pad. So this is just a clean fluid that's going to crack the rock and um, cause the fracture to grow. And then once we've um, pumped our pad, then we introduce the slurry, which is just the propent into the uh, fluid system. So the pressure continues growing the uh, fracture. You pump the propent into that fracture. And the reason you're going to have that propent in place is because once you bleed off the pressure from the frac job, the formation is going to try to close on itself. And that's what creates our artificial permeability, also known as conductivity. So now the propent holds that fracture open, and now we have that flow path for the hydrocarbon to produce through. So that's just a very quick high level overview of, uh, of what we're trying to do with these reservoirs, what we're trying to do with hydraulic fracturing. And um, there's been three types of completions that have really been proven the most effective and the most efficient uh, in these types of uh, reservoirs, and that's plug and perf, ball activated completion system, and the cool tubing activated systems. So we'll dive right into what those systems are. So with plug and perf, when we're doing well bore construction, we've already got our horizontal well drilled in our targeted reservoir. We're going to run our casing string into the well with the drilling rig. And then once we get to the intended depth, of course, we're going to cement it into place. So this is originally designed uh, as a cemented isolation completion. Once we're done with our cementing, we can do our pressure testing, move our drilling rig off of location, and then uh, we bring out our frac crew whenever we're ready to begin fracturing. So uh, one of the things that um, especially is relative to the drilling side is your toe preparation. So with the, the way we just saw it, uh, there's only one way to do it uh, as far as um, 
the toe preparation, if you cement your casing into place without any uh, tools to regain entry, then you're going to be required to do tubing conveyed perforation. So this was a very common way in the beginning of these developments. Uh, actually, for the most part, it was really the only way. So they'd have to go in with cool tubing or a workover rig, do tubing conveyed perforations, and then they would uh, perforate through the casing, through the cement, and then once they were finished, pull out of hole, and um, then they can begin fracturing that first stage. But that also requires an additional, uh, roughly a day to do that, additional cost of services and things like that. So another alternative is the pressure activated uh, frac sleeve. So this is a cementable frac sleeve. You run it, make it up on the drilling rig, onto your casing string, and then uh, you cement it into place. Once you're begin, ready to begin fracturing, you simply apply pressure, the sleeve shifts open, and you can begin fracturing your first stage there. And another option that's become uh, relatively common is a wet shoe. So uh, with a wet shoe, when you're cementing, you're going to uh, cement the casing into place. You've got all your float equipment at the toe of the well. And then uh, towards the end of the cement job, you're going to pump uh, sugar water. So you're going to have a landing collar that has a bypass. Your cement wiper plug lands on that bypass, uh, excuse me, on that landing collar. Then when you apply pressure, it'll shift that, um, that landing collar down, open the bypass, and then you pump sugar water uh, following that so that you clear out the cement, you actually leave the sugar water at the uh, toe of the well, and now, um, now you won't have cement set up at the toe of the well. So when you get ready to begin fracturing, you can just pump um, uh, through, the, um, through your casing overall uh, because you still have access to the formation. So what keeps you protected while your drilling rig is not on location is you have your float shoe and your float collars at the toe. So when the, uh, once you're finished, once you've bled off the pressure from the cement job, and it'll try to come back into your casing, but the pressure will close those valves and keep it from uh, YouTubing back into your casing string. Now, once you're ready to begin fracturing, you're just going to pump through that wet shoe. You can pump down perforation guns and um, begin uh, fracturing your first stage afterwards. So, uh, so once you get past the first stage, once you get past that toe stage, uh, most operators hands down go to a wireline deployed assembly. Uh, so now you can pump into the well through the previously fractured stage. You pump down to the assembly, which of course will consist of wire line. You've got your frac plug at the bottom of the assembly, setting tool above that, which will set the plug and then release from it. And then your perforation guns above that. <clears throat> so once you've reached the intended depth, you send an electric signal through the wire line that'll activate your setting tool, set the frac plug, and then release from the frac plug. And you can pull up hole and to fire your perforations. So once you get to the depth of your first perforation, another electric signal fires your first set of perforation guns, pull up to the depth of your second perforation, another electric signal fires the uh, second set of guns, and pull up to a uh, pole to the depth of your third perforation, another electric signal fires your third set of guns. So this technique is called cluster perforating. So in this example, we have three individual guns. So this would be three clusters per stage. So once you fired uh, all of your perforations, pull out a pole with your wire line, and then uh, you bring back up your frac crew and uh, begin fracturing the second stage. And after that, you're just gonna repeat the process. Shut down your fracturing after you finish fracturing your second stage, run your wire line, set a plug, uh, perforate your third stage, pull out a pole with your wire line, and then begin fracturing your third stage. Uh, run back in with perforations or with wire line, set a plug, perforate, pull out a pole, and fracture your fourth stage. And you just repeat that process until all of the um, uh, stages in the well are complete. Uh, so this has always been the Achilles heel of plug and perf uh, when you're talking about a one-off well anyway. So if you're not doing zipper fracturing or simultaneous fracturing, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, you do have to shut down the frac job between stages, run your wire line while your pressure pumping sitting idle. And, and so surface efficiency can be lacking. Now, if you're using traditional composite plugs, uh, once you finish fracturing the well, you do have to go in through tubing intervention and mill them out. And then once you've done that, you can put your well on production. So if we look at the uh, the fluid distribution through the clusters, uh, so, you know, ideally what we would like to see is even fluid distribution. So the basic theory of hydraulic fracturing, uh, if you're pumping 90 barrels a minute at surface, 
uh, through three clusters. You're assuming that even distribution. So that means your frack design is basically 30 barrels a minute per cluster, per injection point. Now, the reality is, is um, we don't get even fluid distribution. So we're going to look at a very simple example here, just friction losses, right? Because it's the easiest to visualize, especially in this format, in a presentation. So just the distance of encasing between the perforations is going to have some friction loss. So just because of the distance um, between perforations, <clears throat> your frack job would look something like this, where your heel most perforation takes a majority of the frack fluid and your toe most uh, takes the least amount because it's the path of most resistance, whereas this is the path of least resistance um, due to the distance it has to travel. So that's where a technique called limited entry perforating comes into play. So, so once again, this is an extremely simple example. Limited entry perforating can be extremely complicated because not only are you looking at friction, you're also looking at uh, overcoming stresses uh, and everything else to get that even fluid distribution. But the overall concept is the same as what we're looking at here. So, so with this, what we've done now is the toe most perforation, we have five holes. The middle perforation, we have four and the heel most perforation has three. So now from a fluid uh, flow area standpoint, the toe most perforation is the path of least resistance and the heel most is the path of most resistance. So what you wanna do is you basically want to have enough pressure and, and balance out the amount of energy so that it takes the same amount of energy for the fluid and propent to exit each set of perforations. And at least hopefully you get back to even fluid distribution through those perforations. <clears throat> but at least to a certain extent, that's what we can control on the mechanical side, especially if you're talking about the friction and things like that. But um, the reality is, is, you know, these formations are, heterogene uh, are heterogeneous. And so what happens when we uh, get our frack distribution looking something like this? So now we've increased it to six clusters per stage and we've got uh, one really dominant perforation, another dominant perforation, and the rest of them are getting very little to no treatment. So that's where a technique uh, called diverters comes into play. So once again, we're going to look at a very simplistic example. It's, um, it's the easiest one to visualize, but it'll overall give you the concept. So what we're doing here is we're assuming that each of these clusters is basically a stage. So you assume that when you're fracturing, that uh, one cluster is receiving all of the uh, fluid and propent. And then when you're finished pumping the volumes of fluid, fluid and propent that you want, you're going to pump a diverter. And this is a near wellbore diverter. It blocks off near wellbore and forces the fluid to divert out of another set of perforations. So once you're finished pumping that volume, you pump another diverter and it forces the fluid to divert out of another perforation again. So you would just repeat this process until you uh, feel like you've uh, diverted all of the clusters uh, within that stage. Now these can be a lot of different materials, so you may have to go back in and mill these out, or they can be dissolvable as well. So they may just dissolve in the temperatures and the fluids that are down hole. But let's go back to this example here. So what happens if this is our actual distribution and we're trying to use that overly simplistic design here? So, um, so what happens when we pump down uh, diverter? So we blocked off one dominant perforation, but what happens when this other dominant perforation comes into play? It, it's probably going to be uh, receive a lot more than you, what you intended. Also, what if the diverter blocks off a non-dominant perforation? Now it's actually doing the opposite of what it's supposed to. And you also have to be careful. You don't want to pump too much diverter and block off all of your perforations because now you've created a scenario where you've screened out and you're either going to have to go through tubing intervention to recover or wait enough time for the diverter to dissolve. So, so it's definitely a little bit tricky. Um, both limited entry and diverters are a very hot topic and a very debated topic uh, throughout the industry. I, I know plenty of people who argue on both sides that, um, um, that neither of them work, that one of them works, but the other one doesn't. And uh, plenty of them say that both are needed. So it's still very much uh, being experimented with. A lot of lessons are still being learned. But it is a very hot topic and a very relevant topic, um, once again, depending on who you talk to uh, as to whether uh, how effective they are. But one of the things we're seeing, uh, especially since the 2015 downturn, is uh, operators getting more efficient 
using these these strategies. So uh, what they are what this allows them to do is they can consolidate their completions and be more effective. So if their old completion design was this, where we have this section of the well, two stages with three clusters per stage, now they can consolidate in that into one stage with six clusters per stage. So that saves a wireline trip, that saves plugs, that saves a lot of different stuff. So at least theoretically, depending on how you uh, want to do your diverters, you could pump half the job, pump enough diverter for half the perforations, and then pump the other half of the job. But whatever it is, whether you're using limited entry, whether you're using diverters, if you believe that you can get that distribution through more clusters, then uh, it's kind of a winning, uh, it's, it's a very um, appealing uh, scenario from an economic standpoint, because in the top section, let's just say we had 50 stages with three clusters per stage, that's 150 clusters total, so 150 injection points. And in the bottom scenario, we could have 25 stages with six clusters per stage for the same 150 injection points. But in the bottom, that's half the plugs. So you're cutting your plug cost by half. That's half the plug deployment time. So you're cutting uh, uh, downtime down significantly. And then of course, it'll also take less to mill out the plugs. It won't necessarily be half the time, but you have at least half the number of plugs to mill out. So with all these complications with cluster perforating, why do we use it in the first place? It is entirely possible to do single entry plug and perf. We go in, fire a single perforation, fracture through it, plug, single perforation, fracture plug, so on and so forth. The reason we do this is because of efficiency. So this is a um, this is some data pulled from a prominent Permian operator uh, in their Q, uh, Q1 of 2016 presentation. And what they reported is that they were using 9,000 foot laterals, 100 foot per stage with 15 foot cluster spacing. So, uh, so once again, just to kind of cover the nomenclature. So 100 foot per stage would be 100 feet between plugs, 15 foot per cluster, which is gonna be 15 feet between each cluster here. So using that information, that translates into 90 stages overall in the well with six clusters per stage and that's a total of 540 injection points in the well. Now, if we assume two hours of downtime between stages so that we can um, run the wire line, set the plug, perforate and pull out a pole, if you broke that into 90 stages and you assume you have a 24 hour frack crew, that's seven and a half days of fracturing, or uh, excuse me, of only running wire line, that's not including the fracturing time. But if you try to break that into 540 stages, that's 45 days of time just to run your wire line. Uh, so not including the frack job again. So you're, you're really improving efficiency at surface by doing multi-cluster and, um, and, and especially the more clusters per stage you add. So let's stick with that 540 injection point example. There's a lot of different ways that you could uh, uh, set this up. 180 stages with three clusters per stage. That would be 15 days of running wire line if we're assuming that same two hours between stages. If we did it 90 stages with six clusters per stage, seven and a half days of downtime. And then we could do 45 stages with 12 clusters per stage. And that would be 3.75 days of downtime. So, and then with those scenarios, the top one, we have 180 plugs, the middle 90 plugs and the bottom 45 plugs. So you're also saving that additional plug cost as well. But, you know, th those are assuming, once again, uh, one-off wells as far as the downtime between stages. Uh, this is where a technique called that I call simultaneous fracturing operations. Uh, the rest of the industry calls it uh, zipper fracks. The reason I hesitate to call it uh, zipper fracks is because if you go back to 2008, 2009, there are several SPE papers referring to zipper fracks that are actually a very different concept. It's referring to downhole intentional interference between wells. But... What we're actually talking about now when people say zipper frack, it's efficiency at surface. So what we're looking at here, we're looking at two laterals. So this is an aerial view. So if you're standing at surface, you look down at your toes, the wells are going out away from you. So or the laterals are going out away from you. So what the, uh, once you get into pad drilling mode, the well heads are that close, are close enough together to enable the zipper fracturing. Um, it allows you to run uh, pressure pumping and wireline services at the same time. So you can be running wireline on well A while fracturing well B. Then when you're done, you switch the services over, run uh, uh, pressure pumping on well A, wireline on well B, and then switch them back over 
uh, continuously. So the wellheads are close enough together at surface. You set up your manifold with your frack crew. So it's just a matter of turning a valve to control whether you're pumping to well A or well B. And then with your wire line, it's just a matter of sw uh, swinging your crane uh, with the assembly to well A or well B to control it. So you never have to move your frack crew. Um, it helps eliminate or at least reduce the amount of downtime between stages because you're not having uh, pressure pumping sit idle while running wire line and vice versa. So this has led to, to huge efficiency gains with plug and perf. So, uh, so one of the uh, newer technologies with plug and perf is uh, the disintegrating frack plug. So with this concept, it's, uh, it's the same overall functionality as a traditional, a traditional frack plug. But instead of making or being made of composite material that you have to mill out once you're finished fracturing with this plug, both the, uh, the plug and the ball will disintegrate, remove itself from the well, and it helps eliminate the mill out after the frack job. So it's, that makes the well interventionless. So if you're worried about milling out plugs and long laterals, you no longer have to do that. And you also have a full production diameter after the plug is, um, is, uh, has been removed or has removed itself. Now, the dissolvable plugs are a little bit more expensive than composites. Um, and at least to a certain extent, they're, they're new enough in the industry. They have their own set of challenges in the Permian uh, and the Marcellus with the low temperatures. And each, each region has its own challenges. So it's not that common that you see dissolvable plugs ran for the whole well. But one of the common scenarios you do see is dissolvable plugs at the toe of the well and composites towards the heel. And that's because operators uh, run the composite plugs within the range of coil tubing and that interventionless uh, dissolving plug outside of the range of coil tubing. So that way they can go in, mill out the composites, and then just give it time and the dissolvable plugs will remove themselves from the well. <clears throat> so, uh -uh. Sorry about that. My pups are wound up this morning for some reason. They're normally super lazy at this time of the day. So, um, of course, it always happens when, when, when I'm going live there, but um, that's the way it goes. Anyway, <clears throat> so that's the overview of plug and perf. So we'll move on to the next system, and that's the ball activated completion system. So there's a couple of different ways to set this up, but we're going to focus on the uh, fluid activated packer setup. So we, uh, we run our system uh, into the well uh, using our drilling rig. We make up all of our components to the casing, and those components are going to be your open hole packers, in this case, the fluid activated packers, and your ball activated frag sleeves. So once you get to the intended depth, you're going to uh, spot the activation fluid that will activate those packers. Once you've done that, you set your casing packer. And then uh, once your casing packer is set, you can do your pressure testing, move your drilling rig off location. Now over time, that activation fluid will cause that rubber to swell on those uh, fluid activated packers. They contact the target reservoir, and that's what provides you your annular isolation uh, between stages. So once you're ready to begin fracturing, bring out your frack crew, drop the first ball in the well, pump it down to that, um, that toe sleeve, apply pressure, and then shift the sleeve open and you begin your first stage fracturing. Now, if we zoom in on the second sleeve here, uh, the sleeves themselves are conceptually very simple. You've got the sleeve, you've got your fracturing ports on the outside, and then if you look at the cutout on the inside, you have a uh, insert that's covering up those ports when it's in the closed position and it has a ball seat profile. So as you're fracturing stage one, you're pumping through all the other ball seats in the well. And, uh, and then as you're finishing up stage one, you pump the ball that corresponds to the second sleeve, uh, pump it down hole, apply pressure, shift the sleeve open. And now you force your fluid to divert out of your second stage. So you, it diverts the fluid out of these ports here on the sleeve and it isolates from the previously fractured stage through your tubing. So if we move up hole to the third stage, as we're finishing fracturing our second stage, we're going to drop the ball that corresponds to the third sleeve. Uh, it lands on seat, you apply pressure, shift the sleeve open. We blocked it off through tubing from the previously fractured stage, and now it forces the fluid to divert out of that third sleeve. So, um, and then the process is just going to be repeated from there. Now, it's a little bit difficult to tell in the animation, but each of these balls and ball seats get incrementally larger 
as you're moving from the toe of the well towards the heel of the well. So the smallest ball will be at the toe. That way that small ball can pass through all of the larger seats above it. And that's what gives you your selectivity for the, the different stages uh, in that well. That's how you open one sleeve at a time. So from this point, your fracturing procedure is the same. You just drop the ball that corresponds to the fourth sleeve, pump it down hole, uh, shift the frac sleeve open, fracture your fourth stage. And then once you're finished there, drop the ball that corresponds to the fifth sleeve and so on and so forth. So this has always been one of the highlights of this type of system is that it, it has nonstop fracturing operations, even on a one well basis. Uh, you never actually have to shut down your frac job. You may slow it down occasionally to drop a ball or as the ball approaches seat, but it's nonstop fracturing. You never have to shut down uh, between stages. Now, if we zoom in on the post frac operations, we're of course going to produce the fractures we've created back through those ports we fractured out of and then uh, back to surface. Uh, the balls will be pushed back towards surface from production. And in a lot of cases, those are actually dissolving balls as well. So they'll remove themselves from the well bore with the temperatures and the fluids down hole. Now, these can be technically considered an interventionless system. But as you see here, you still have the ball seat diameter. So if that's an actual diameter restriction, if that's going to cause you problems, uh, you can remove that ball seat. Uh, most of them are designed to be, or they're, they're cast iron material and they're designed to be easy to mill out. So you can go in, mill out those ball seats and get at least a near full wellbore diameter. Now, uh, one of the um, uh, alternative technologies, it's really not new anymore. It's been out for five, six years now or so, is um, cemented sleeves. Now, keep in mind when you're cementing the well, kind of like we saw with the, um, um, with the wet shoe earlier, you're pumping your cement through the casing, following it with a cement wiper plug to make sure you don't leave any cement stringers in the casing and make sure that you get all that cement out to the annulus. Well, it's no different with the ball activated sleeves, except for now you have ball seat diameters that you have to get through. So you, um, you pump your cement through the casing, through those ball seats, and you follow it with a cement wiper plug, but you have to be sure that you don't have two small ball seats so that cement plug gets caught in it, opens that sleeve prematurely, and dumps all your cement back into your casing. So, um, so it's entirely possible to do the cemented ball sleeves, but you are gonna be limited on the number of stages. So um, generally speaking, you're not gonna be able to go below a two inch diameter in those sleeves, which for most service companies, that leaves you at about 25, maybe 30 individual sleeves uh, that can be used in these cemented applications. But the uh, cemented sleeves also have the ability to do multi-entry points. So this is very similar to the multi-clusters with plug and perf. So with these sleeves, um, you can run multiple sleeves per stage. So you drop the ball, pump it down hole, it opens this sleeve, passes through, opens this sleeve, passes through. This is a standard sleeve, so it opens the sleeve and catches it. And now you're fracturing through all of these at the same time. Drop the next size ball, open pass, open pass, catches and opens, and then fracture these at the same time. So it allows you to do uh, cluster perforating with, um, uh, with multiple sleeves, with uh, ball drop sleeves. So even if you're limited to, let's say 25 stages, 25 individual stages, if you can do or five sleeves per stage, that's still 125 overall injection points in the well. So that helps you at least with the number of <clears throat> number of injection points. Now with these multi-entry uh, sleeves here, the cementable multi-entry sleeves, uh, most service companies really have it designed to where it really can basically mimic plug and perf. So you have adjustable frack ports on it. <clears throat> so you can block off frack ports to reduce the flow area, which means that you can uh, do any limited entry strategies that you may want to do. You can change the diameter so you can make them larger or smaller. And you can also do any kind of phasing or anything else. So with these adjustable frack ports, it really and truly can mimic plug and perf. Now, if we look at a cutout view, overall, it's, it's a pretty similar concept. Uh, you have the insert covering up those frack ports. You drop the ball, it lands on seats, you apply pressure. But now with these, um, these other shifting sleeves, the ones that'll uh, shift open and then allow the ball to pass, you, you know, each service company is gonna be a little bit different. But uh, the simple way to view it is you've got a, a profile in the sleeve. So you shift open, those, uh, that profile allows the uh, ball seat to subside and it moves on down hole. So that gives you an idea of how, how the, um, uh, those multi-entry sleeves work.
Now, once again, uh, you're not seeing these are used in um, uh, entire well bores. In most cases, you're seeing them ran in the toe of the well. That way they can drop balls at the toe of the well, fracture uh, with the um, procedures that they normally would. And especially with these multi-entry and the adjustable ports, if they're doing plug and perf above it, they can mimic exactly what they're doing with plug and perf. Then once they're done with the sleeves, they go back with their traditional composite plugs and plug and perf above it. And uh, once again, this is really uh, focused on longer laterals where uh, you may not be able to get cool tubing down to be able to mill out. So you'll run your composite plugs, your traditional plug and perf within the range of cool tubing uh, where you're confident you can mill out the plugs and the interventionless uh, ball drop sleeves at the uh, toe of the well outside of the range of cool tubing. Now there's two, new, two newer technologies with the ball activated sleeves uh, and both of them really have the same objectives. So it's a virtually unlimited number of stages with minimal or no diameter restrictions. So the first one we'll look at is counter mechanisms. So this is the uh, simplest one to view. This would be mechanical motion basically. But when you drop a ball, you can see it passes through each sleeve and it counts down. So when the uh, ball hits sleeve zero, that means the sleeve is in the run position. You apply that pressure and it opens the sleeve and you begin fracturing that first stage. Now you're going to drop the exact same size ball again and it's going to count down. But the difference here is that the second sleeve in the well is sleeve zero. It's in the run position. So now that's the active sleeve. So you apply pressure, shift the second sleeve open, and you begin fracturing that stage. Now you're going to drop the exact same size ball again, and now the third sleeve is in the zero position, so you can uh, fracture it. So this allows you to drop the same size ball over and over again, and um, so you're minimizing that uh, number of, or that amount of diameter restriction uh, in your well. And there's mechanical versions, there's electrical versions, there's a few versions that are um, based on mechanical motion and also electronics too. So a lot of different um, service companies have a lot of different approaches with these types of sleeves. So another one out there that a couple of companies have uh, uh, similar versions on is um, the ball seats with a collet locator. So with this one, now our sleeve doesn't have the ball seat in the insert itself. It has another type of profile. So we, um, <clears throat> so we're actually going to pump the ball seat into the well. So we pump our assembly down hole you got that collet profile in the insert of the sleeve. You have a collet on the ball seat. And then of course you already have the ball on the ball seat. That way you can pump the assembly down hole um, without having wireline, without having any kind of intervention tools. So now in this case, the, uh, the collet and the ball seat, or excuse me, the collet and the profile do not match up. So it doesn't catch in that sleeve and it continues moving down the well. As it approaches the correct sleeve, it snaps into place. Now the ball seat is installed into the sleeve, uh, essentially. And now we really and truly have the same scenario uh, with the traditional ball seat uh, with the ball already on seat. So you apply pressure, shift the sleeve open, isolate from below, divert through those ports. And then uh, afterwards, these are designed to be um, disintegrating balls. So the ball will remove itself from the well. And this is a large diameter, so you can leave it in the well if you want to. Uh, or you could retrieve it as well. <clears throat> so once again, those two types of uh, newer sleeves, their, their objective is a virtually unlimited number of stages with minimal or no diameter restriction. All right, so the third type of completion system is the cool tubing activated system. And the most common way to set this up is with the frag sleeves. So we've got our, our um, sleeves installed in the well, made up to the casing, ran in with the drilling rig. And once we're to the intended depth, we pump cement, we um, get it into place. And then once we're done with that, we do our pressure testing and we can move our drilling rig off of location. So uh, when we're ready to begin fracturing, we bring out our cool tubing and our frack crew. We run the system down hole, and then we're going to locate each sleeve, open that sleeve and begin fracturing. So you'll hear this um, system referred to a lot of times as annular fracturing. And the reason you hear annular fracturing is because you're actually going to be pumping your frac job between the annulus of the coil tubing and the casing. So that's why you'll hear uh, it called annular fracturing. <clears throat> now, if we zoom into the individual operation of the sleeve, 
Uh, we Once we have our system in place, we're going to pump down the annulus. We're going to apply that fracture. Our cool tubing packer will isolate from below. Uh, we've opened the ports with our cool tubing assembly, and that's what forces the fluid to divert out of that uh, out of the intended stage. Now, as we're fracturing, that's actually going to create a collapsing force on your cool tubing. So in most cases, you're not actually going to pump or, or you will pump fluid through your cool tubing, but it's not really contributing to the frack job. So, uh, so you pump fluid through your cool tubing and out of either a sand jet perforator or some sort of circulation sub. And, um, and it's normally at a very low rate. And one of the main purposes is to apply back pressure against that collapsing force. So it helps protect your cool tubing from collapsing during the frack job. Uh, but it also has some other benefits uh, to being to the, have the ability to pump through your cool tubing and back to surface. So first and foremost, it gives you a dead leg pressure reading. So the pressure you're reading at surface for your annular side, this is turbulent flow. You've got friction against the casing. You've got friction against the cool tubing. And so what you're seeing at surface, what you're reading at surface is not what's actually happening real time down hole at the sleeve. But this is a very low flow rate. Um, this is a clean fluid. You've got an injection point right here. And uh, so what you're reading, your pressure through the cool tubing is pretty close to what's actually happening at the injection point. So that's referred to as a dead leg pressure reading. So that can help you prevent a screen out uh, by seeing the pressure at the injection point rise up quicker than you would through the annulus. And just to give you an idea, if anybody is not familiar with the screen out, uh, it's basically where you pump so much sand that it cannot physically go into your fracture. Um, and in most cases, it's because your fracture takes a 90 degree turn or it gets smaller than you anticipated, whatever it is. But if it's bad enough, you can no longer pump into your fracture and it backs up into your casing. So it helps prevent the uh, screen outs uh, by giving you that pressure reading. But if you don't catch it in time, if you do have a screen out, uh, where you can't pump into the well anymore, you've got your prop and pump uh, backed up into your casing, it does have hands down the best contingency option. You go ahead and unset your cool tubing packer, at least if you can, and then you have the ability to pump through your cool tubing out of that sand jet perforator or the circulating sub, and you have the ability to pump that excess prop and back to surface, recover from it, and um, move on to your next stage. So uh, from a contingency option standpoint, uh, this is one of the better uh, options out there because you already have cool tubing on location at the depth of the problem with the ability to circulate back to surface. So I wanna start wrapping things up here. You know, it, it is a very complicated subject um, uh, for sure. Uh, but you know, when you're trying to compare the completion systems, uh, each of the completion systems uh, really and truly provide effective multi-stage isolation. There's been hundreds of thousands of stages with all of these systems. Each of them does require different services, which can play a big role if you don't have wireline in an area, if you don't have cool tubing in the area, if it's uh, extremely expensive for either of the services, things like that. <clears throat> Any of the systems can be isolated with cement, uh, cemented liner or with open hole completions. So you can do open hole plug and perf, you can do cemented sleeves. And <coughs> and each of the systems also can do multi-entry or single entry point. So we could do single entry plug and perf. We can do multi-entry sleeves as well. So how do we choose the right completion system? And, and as you can imagine, that's a very complicated and long answer. But so we'll, we'll kind of focus in on just a few examples uh, for today's talk. So, so let's look at an example here, um, a, a couple of uh, two examples. So the first one, we'll have a little bit larger number of stages. So let's assume a 40 stage frack job, uh, one hour per stage in the frack plan and no operational issues. So if we look at the ball activated completion system, that'll be 40 hours total time to stimulate. So that's two days with a 24 hour crew, four days with a 12 hour crew. With plug and perf, we have to make one additional assumption. Uh, assuming that it's one well, you can't do zipper fracturing, a.k.a. Uh, simultaneous fracturing operations. But let's assume it takes three hours to run in with wire lines, set the plug, perforate and pull out of hole. That's 160 hours total time to stimulate. That's seven days with a 24 hour crew, 14 days with a 12 hour crew. So in this case, the ball activated system really kind of stands out because you're taking your frac cycle time down by almost a week in most cases. 
But let's just look at a, a, an example where it's just a low number of stages. Uh, so let's just say it's five stages, the same assumptions with one hour per stage in the frack plan, no operational issues. With the ball activated, that would be five hours total time to simulate. That's one day with a 24-hour crew or a 12-hour crew. And then with the plug and perf, the additional three-hour assumption, that's 20 hours total time to stimulate. <clears throat> so it's a day with the 24-hour crew, two days with a 12-hour crew. So in this case, there's not really a huge difference. So you're really going to have to dive deep into your local economics to really determine which one is the most effective and the most economic uh, for this application. Now, this is, uh, this is probably one of my favorite slides to present, uh, especially in the last um, three or four years. Um, we really have to consider the effect of the downturn on completion decisions. So it's, it's extremely easy to oversimplify and, um, and say, well, one completion is dominant. It must be the best completion system. So uh, if you look at the U.S. market right now, plug and perf is probably 98% of the market. Um, so I've seen a lot of people, at least in my opinion, this is a gross oversimplification, just say, well, plug and perf must be the best. It's the dominant completion. Well, it's really dominated since 2015 because of the downturn, because of a lot of the improvements in efficiency. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's always the best situation uh, for every application either. So let's look at a uh, scenario here. This is going to be uh, from the U.S. Bakken, but this is the way a typical U.S. operator is structured. You have your drilling AFE, the, the drilling budget, the approved financial expenditure. So that's everything that's done with the drilling rig. Your completions AFE, that's everything done between the drilling rig and the production. And production AFE is everything done after the completion. So with the drilling AFE, what's kind of unique to it with regards to completions is that if we're running sleeves, if we're running packers, that actually goes on the drilling AFE. So it's a very interesting dynamic. Uh, I've seen multiple times through my career where a completion engineer uh, wants to try a sleeve type system. They go to the drilling department, they present it, they say, hey, we're going to run sleeves. And uh, the drilling department laughs them out of the room because they're like, you're not adding $200,000 to my AFE, causing me to miss my budget and causing me to miss my uh, bonus. So, um, so that, that silo with U.S. operators particularly can be a little bit of a hindrance uh, as well when you're talking about uh, kind of the collaboration. So let's look at the uh, Bakken example. So in 2015, <clears throat> well, pre-downturn, so before uh, 2015, the state of North Dakota gave operators one year between drilling the well and fracturing the well and putting it on production. In 2015, when the downturn hit, the state of North Dakota extended that. So operators had uh, two years from finishing drilling the wells so that they can hold the lease to fracturing it and putting it on production. So there were a lot of prominent Bakken operators that publicly stated, we will continue drilling wells so that we can hold our leases, but we will not be completing them and putting on, on production for the two years or until we see an oil price that we like. So... So that set up a pretty interesting dynamic. <clears throat> now, before I get into this, <laughs> uh, don't quote these costs. Now, I do. We're about to talk uh, about costs on completion equipment. Uh, this is based on you know a certain play in late 2015. So I do feel that like these numbers were pretty accurate for the time. But don't run to your service company and say I'm overpaying uh, for these uh, tools because uh, you know that's this is all very relevant. So. Take this example, take your numbers, put it in if you want to use this as a cost exercise. So what are the completion costs on the drilling AFE? So the wellbore construction costs, basically. So for casing, it's the same regardless of the completion system. You have to have casing. Uh, if cementing a 10,000-foot lateral, that's about $50,000 if you're just talking about the lateral portion. Um, if you have 50 ball activated frack sleeves and you assume that they're $3,000 each, that would be $150,000. If you had 50 open hole packers to go with that, um, <clears throat> and once again, assume that they're $3,000, that's $150,000. And if you had the cool tubing activated sleeves, uh, and assume that they're 3,000 each, then, uh, that would be 150,000. So your wellbore construction costs per system a 50-stage plug-and-perf would be $50,000 for the cement. 
a 50 stage open hole ball activated system would be $300,000 for the uh, sleeves and the Packers. 50 stage coil tubing activated system would be $200,000 for the sleeves and the cement. A 50 stage open hole coil tubing would be $300,000 for the sleeves and the Packers. And a 50 stage open hole plug and perf would be $150,000 for the uh, Packers. So when we look at this uh, scenario, uh, if, the, if an operator's strategy is to drill but not complete at for a couple of years at least, uh, plug and perf is the clear choice here. I mean, you're talking about saving millions of dollars within less than 10 wells uh, in a time where cash is king. So it's, it's a no-brainer uh, that plug and perf would uh, uh, rule from a well bore construction cost. Now, the other kicker, this is not a 50-stage plug and perf. It's whatever you want it to be because it's just a casing string that's cemented into place. All these other systems, it's a 50-stage system. You're not going to be able to adjust the completion once you come back to fracture it. But if you've modified your completion and now it's a 25-stage uh, completion two years later, you can do that with a plug and perf well. If it's 100 stages, you can do a 100-stage plug and perf. So I, I largely think that that was actually kind of dumb luck to a certain extent. I don't think we were really kind of uh, thinking about that when it, this happened, but it worked out well in the operator's favor. <clears throat> All right, so, so to kind of at least attempt to tie everything together, right? Because the, the silos can be, uh, can definitely be a problem. And it's kind of an interesting, um, even in the international market markets where operators are not quite as siloed, there's, there always seems to be a communication gap. I remember years ago, uh, we were at an international conference uh, we were presenting and uh, uh, the two people in the audience worked for the same company, had lunch together frequently even. But um, one one guy was like, wow, man, we really should try that. And the other one's like, yeah, I'd, I'd like to do that. But they just weren't communicating well with each other, even though they didn't really have those quote unquote silos that U.S. operators have a lot of times. Uh, they, they still weren't uh, communicating as well either. So very important to bring uh, everything together. So when we're talking about uh, downhole completions with the actual completion, the fracking itself, uh, it, can, it directly affects it. Uh, fracturing logistics is controlled uh, by what type of completion you run. So, you know, besides pressure pumping, what other services are required? What are the cost of those services? Uh, once again, that can vary wildly. I remember back in 2012 or so, uh, looking at some cost and a uh, coal tubing unit was $40,000 a day in Oklahoma and it was $120,000 a day in California. So, you know, three times the coal tubing cost uh, per day, that's going to play a big difference. <clears throat> and does nonstop fracturing operations have any benefit? Uh, you've got to have the supply of the fluid, the supply of the propent, the supply of any other chemicals that you may have with it. And, and that, that applies for um, the simultaneous fracturing operations with plug and perf as well as the ball drop systems. Uh, so that can play a big factor. Um, you know, if you don't have the water supply, but to fracture two stages per day, then a nonstop fracturing uh, operation doesn't have you in a benefit. So you're really gonna have to look, reevaluate your overall economics. <clears throat> uh, your fluid displacement uh, downhole is going to be directly um, dependent on the completion, whether, whether it's single entry points versus multi-entry points. And uh, overall, the completion system itself has a big impact uh, because it directly affects <clears throat> the frack job because it can limit your pump rates, your slurry concentrations, pressure ratings, and other parameters. So the last thing you want to happen is um, run a completion system into the well, go out to fracture it, and realize that you can't uh, pump the frack job that you've designed because you don't have the right completion down hole. And then, um, you know, drilling impacts the wellbore completion. So uh, the size of the wellbore and the casing is determined when you're drilling the well. Uh, poor quality wellbores uh, can ca cause a, a lot of challenges. Uh, first off, landing the completion at the intended depth and also uh, difficult achieving annular isolation. And that's whether you're using cement or open hole packers. Uh, so to give you an example, uh, when I was in the Marcellus, one of my customers they, uh, they decided to cut cost by reducing, uh, uh, well, basically by cheaping out on their horizontal drilling, their directional drilling. So they went with the cheapest company, they just got the wells done, and um, they, did not, they were not able to get five and a half inch diameter casing 
into an eight and three quarter inch open hole uh, because the wells had been drilled just that poorly. A lot of spirals, a lot of undulations. And uh, at the end of the day, they ended up having to do a reamer run to get the casing in. And uh, it actually ended up costing them more by going with the um, lower end directional drilling, the cheapest option out there. And, you know, if this is what our well looks like, you know, in our animations uh, and what we like to think, they're, they're perfect 90 degree, uh, perfect straight lateral. The reality is, is we have undulations, we have spirals, we have a lot of different things. And I mean, you know, even if you're using cement, I mean, you're going to have issues with the, the casing with a lot with the, these erratic uh, wellbore profiles because you're going to have high points and low points of the well. So you might have cement that doesn't set up in certain areas, uh, thick on the top, small on the bottom, thick on the bottom, small on the top. Um, so it can create a lot of issues with isolation uh, for your completions. And it's not going to really improve using open hole packers either just because of that well, uh, of that profile. So either way you go, you would struggle <clears throat> with uh, isolation down hole if you don't have uh, a, a decent well bore. So yeah, so that's it, uh, it for me. Um, you know, thank you everybody for joining me. Uh, we'll open it up for Q and A right now. Uh, if you want to reach out to me for additional questions, feel free. There's my contact information. And if you want to know more about this subject, like I said, there's plenty of other free resources out on my website at uog.training. So do we have many questions come through, uh, David? Uh, I know we've had a bunch that have come through throughout the, okay. the entire time period. And I have to say this, that was probably one of the most informative sessions I've ever seen on our show because how little I know about that area. Like I know some of the stuff and I know some of like real, real little basic concepts, but all the different types and like how everything can be mixed matched together. I can only imagine the, the matrix and planning that goes into trying to determine what's the best uh, setup for being able to do these wells. And I, and, and I understand even more now, like when people say, Oh, they're just doing copy paste, uh, uh frack stuff right. because i could see why like just doing a copy paste would be a lot easier than having to just go okay let's do a reevaluation let's quote all the stuff from the so many different service providers and vendors and you know you're doing composites are you doing this are you doing that like right i i mean that is i mean there's just so many different pieces of the puzzle that go into uh to doing this so the, i if you guys, if you guys have some questions that you that you threw out during the presentation that didn't get answered, I know there's a couple of people in the the comment section that was kind of answering some of the th stuff that, go, that was going along. But if you have questions, now's the time to be able to start throwing them out there. Aaron is an absolutely amazing resource for this stuff, um, especially I know for my audience ha happens a lot to people happen to be on the the drilling side. But remember, if you're on the drilling side there's a good chance that you're going to get moved over to the completion site at some point in time. So uh, if you guys have those questions, you know, be sure to go ahead and start throwing them out. So um, I'm not going to scroll all the way back through. I'm just going to find whichever questions we have here first, but I do want to put this one up here. Uh, Harold says, uh, Aaron Burton, thank you. Fantastic presentation. You hit all the key aspects of our challenges. Well done. And this comes from the North American completions manager for Repsol. All right, so oh, excellent. Thank you. I, I, great guy. Actually, I had lunch with him yesterday. It was so awesome. So really happy to be able to see him tuning in. Maybe we need to be able to get um, Gerardo on on the show sometime. So all right, guys, let's let's find some some questions. Uh, uh, Romero, uh, Doctor Romero uh, says, "Great presentation. How do you deal with natural fracture or faults and high dog leg zones?" Well, the short answer to that, at least every operator that I've talked to with this issue is avoid them, <laughs> avoid them at all costs. Uh, you know, it, even if you're um, it, at least, like I said, everybody I've talked to, it's a waste of your time and money to try to pump uh, fluid and profit there. You're just not going to get the hydrocarbon out of it. So uh, the Marcellus, when I was up there, it's it's known for having an occasional fault here and there, uh, large swarms of natural fractures, and and that's exactly what we did. We literally bypassed it um, all. So, and you know, once again, that depends on your completion system. If you know the faults there, it's easy to avoid it when you're installing your completion. If you realize it later after you've already installed the completion, yeah, you're kind of limited unless it's the plug and perf with the casing. It's pretty easy to bypass just by uh, pulling your wire line up pole and avoiding it. 
Well, I, I think Mark really hits it here. Great presentation. I had about a dozen questions I almost mm -hmm. asked, but then you went ahead and covered it. So awesome. this is going to be one of these videos. Th I think this is probably going to be one of these uh, Fred Dupree style videos that like people are going to go back and watch for a lot of time to be to, to come. So if you have anybody that's in your life or that is in the oil and gas industry, it doesn't understand completions, just send them the link to this video. We'll have it here on LinkedIn and it's also live on YouTube. We did get that question earlier. So uh, Mr. Deaton asked question, why have a ball slash seat profile on pumpable call it? Why have a ball, ball seat profile? Yeah. Well, so so that's just kind of one design of it, right? And that particular design, it, what it kind of allows you to do is after the collet's locked into place, the ball seat, or excuse me, the ball dissolves, and it leaves a relatively um, a relatively large diameter to produce through. Uh, so that's one reason to have it. Uh, otherwise, I mean, you can do darts and different things like that. But, um, you know, once again, it's just that's one company's design of it. Um, and, and hands down, the most common way to do it. Uh, that company has more uh, runs than most of the others uh, in the uh, in the market so far. So, um, so I think that maybe I hope that answered your question. Um, if, if not, not keep, it, keep it coming. Yeah, if not, keep, keep, uh, keep it coming. Running. We've got some more stuff. So Kennedy actually asked if you pull back up your uh, contact okay. information, um, and we'll we'll show that one. Let's see. Um, am, am I still able that? to? Uh, yeah, share my screen. Yes, it's still up there. Okay, can you, you can see it right now? Yeah. Uh, let me pull Kennedy's question off. There you guys go. Yep. Yeah. So, so uh, WRN Burton at UOGtraining.com. Also, uh, at least hopefully my website's easy to remember. UOG training. Um, and you, the, it's uh, <laughs> honestly it kind of creeps me out because uh, I'm I'm a kind of a private person, but uh, doing what I do, I have to have all my contact information out there. So. Uh, you know, as long as you don't have something to sell me, always feel free to reach out. <laughs> All right, guys. So be sure to go and check that one out. Um, and then also, uh, what's your YouTube channel? Uh, so I, you should actually be able to find it really by typing my name. But um, if not, uh, there, there, we is, go. there we go. YouTube.com backslash C backslash Aaron Burton. All right. Yeah, there's plenty of great content on there. Um, probably should have watched some of that before this today, <laughs> but, uh, all right. So, uh, do, 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 let me try to see, cause we've got a lot of people. So, uh, Salim, who's been on, he was part of the, uh, RSS event. It says, uh, yes. thank you for excellent presentation. Uh, Jordan saying, uh, thank you for the presentation. What a great presentation. Thank you for sharing all this information is much appreciated. Wow. Um, yes, I agree. It was most informative for me as well. Thank you, Aaron and David. I didn't do anything. So don't give me any things. Thanks. I was just, I was just trying to keep up with like paying attention and making sure everything goes smoothly here. Um, most of the time, like I, I know some of the basic contents, so I don't have to completely pay attention to what's going on in the presentation. I could just make sure all the comments are happening. This one, I was like, I don't know any of this. I want to be taking, taking notes. Well, but, but you do deserve thanks though, because you do this on a weekly basis and, and sharing this amount of knowledge that you, you organize, but this is fantastic, man. It's, it's, uh, it's great to see the industry uh, organizing these types of um, shows. So uh, as far as the presentation package, I know that this is what you do for a living, so I'm not going to expect that right. you just give it out there for free. But how, if people want to be able to go through a course or something with you, how would they go about that? Yeah, so so I, I'm willing to give out the PDF for sure. Um, I, I do oh. recommend uh, the PDF. I mean, as you can see, my presentation is not very wordy, so I don't know how, how much use the PDF would be. But uh, especially with this presentation, you will be able to find a large majority of it on my website. Um, uh, it, you know, there, there is a, a paid course on there as well. And that'll obviously have a lot more, but there's a free course and there's also my video blog. So a lot of the stuff that was covered today can actually be found there as well. So it might be a little bit more useful to re uh, revert back to this video and, or some of the shorter videos as well. Yeah. So everybody that's here watching this, uh, just like I had asked in the past to be able to subscribe to my YouTube channel, go and do the same thing for Aaron right? Uh, you're just helping out the, the oil and gas community. And if anything, this is the kind of information that the people outside of our industry need to be able to see that right. this isn't just, you know, the wild, wild west. There are very specific technologies. There's a lot of forward thinking that's taking place to be able to do uh, things in the most uh, efficient um, environmentally and, um, you know, 
best manner possible, right? So Aaron is one of the people that's absolutely leading the way on being able to educate not only people in our industry, but outside of our industry. So we'll give him a follow on LinkedIn. Uh, William says, great presentation. Awesome that you can simply explain some very complex issues. Thanks. Yes, I 100% I uh, agree. Uh, regarding well bore quality and its impact on completion, because this is a favorite topic on the drilling side, would you say there is a bigger problem from accumulating small effects, uh, uh, spiraling uh, lateral hole way, or from isolated severe problems, a single large kink in their mid lateral? Hmm. Great uh, question, Mark. It is. That, that's a pretty interesting question. I don't know if I've ever had something like that. Um, I, I think my gut would say more like the um, prolonged spiraling throughout, uh, just because that could potentially impact your entire lateral. You know, um, it, it's pretty common, um, especially out towards the toe, especially at the rate we're drilling nowadays. Uh, it's it's pretty common to hear stories of the toe not breaking down. And normally when operators go back, they realize that they've kind of drilled out a zone there. So overall, it doesn't play a huge impact. So, so yeah, I, I, I think I would go with if you, if you kind of quote unquote tamper with the entire well bore over, you know, even if there's a certain section that has a, a pretty bad damage, you could bypass it if you needed to. Uh, now, that being said, <laughs> uh, if you have a kink, let's say that kink is really towards the heel. And then when you apply hydraulic fracture, uh, hydraulic fracturing pressure, and it causes the casing to collapse. And if you can no longer complete the rest of the lateral because of that casing collapse, that's a big deal. So, um, and you know, you can see that in certain areas. Um, China has a lot of tectonic issues. Argentina does and certain plays in Canada as well. So casing collapse has actually become a pretty, uh, pretty common issue. So, so yeah, I, I guess the answer is it could be both. It just depends on where it is in the well. If it's out towards the toe, eh, you lose a section. If it's towards the heel and you can no longer enter your well bore, that's going to be a problem for the entire well. There we go. Uh, just a general question uh, from Aaron's personal experience and point of view. How often does the isolation issue is noticed in the field and its consequences going forward? Um, very little of the time, uh, you know, cement bond locks are not done on these horizontal wells. Um, it is kind of a, and, and that's the thing I always caution people. Um, that's the big difference between conventional and unconventional, in my opinion, conventional offshore V zero ratings are critical. Uh, you know, the, the, the quality of the products are critical onshore with these applications. Good enough is okay. Uh, you know, if, even if you have a leak path down hole, let's say, so if you have this isolation issue, if you have a channel through your cement, if you have your packer leaking, you are still pumping propent down hole. So I think what happens in a lot of cases is that propent bridges off that leak path and it continues fracturing as uh, intended anyway. So, you know, as long as you can create that path of least resistance, I think for the most part, we still achieve our objectives uh, with the frag job. So, so it's very, it's kind of one of those things where it's common knowledge that it happens. It's common knowledge that it probably happens pretty frequently, but since it doesn't pose a real danger uh, being downhole and we're still relatively effective, uh, keep moving on. All right, so Michelle says, uh, great job, Aaron. I got a ton of information from your presentation. You. Uh, Andrew, uh, Ebert, uh, that presentation was fantastic. There was so much to consider and it was eye-opening to further understand this niche of our industry. Thank you for your time today, sir. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, Salim says, uh, what are the mu must have characteristics of cement for a long lateral string? Ooh, so that's a good question. It, it, it does get a little bit beyond my expertise as far as the quality of cement. So I, I'll just kind of give you the rule of thumb that I've always heard uh, from, from the experts in cement. Um, they, they always say that basically it should mimic your formation uh, as far as breakdown, as far as everything else. Um, and that way, you know, it, it um, so, so the overall properties are very similar to that, <clears throat> to that formation. And that allows you to successfully break it down that, uh, you know, you, you don't want to have it too hard to where you can't break it down and get to the formation, but it allows it to break down while still isolating. So, so that's always the general rule of thumb I've heard from, from my, uh, colleagues and the experts on the cementing side of the business. 
Uh, Reggio says, engineering behind the presentation was excellent. The plan to eliminate uh, NPT is great idea, extraordinary. I have to say, uh, the amount of time that you had to have put into that PowerPoint presentation is phenomenal. That's a lot of animations to be able to get right and to be able to make sure they flow smoothly. So kudos yep. to you for, for, for that one. Uh, well, thank you. Yep. Uh, Ronnie says, great presentation. Armin says, uh, great job with the presentation. Wow. I mean, everybody's loving this one. This is one of the few where we I watched like the viewership count just kind of creep up, creep up, creep up, and then just nice. still, I mean, just, I mean, lots of people were definitely uh, glued in on this one. Do you have a pressure profile graphs of each event described in the presentation? Uh, I'm not exactly for sure what you might be asking there. If you're talking about maybe pressure charts during the frack job, uh, our men feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I do have some that are from public uh, data sources that I may be able to share with you um, or that I can share with you. Uh, but just to make sure that I'm kind of understanding what you're meaning with the pressure profiles, uh, uh, reach out to me and I'll, I'll see if I can help you out there. I like this one from uh, Andrew says, I'm sharing this with my whole team. Awesome. Thanks. There we go. All right, Andrew's got a question, but she's still at the background. So, Andrew, if you want to come on and add, just ask your question, you're more than welcome to do. So you'd have to turn on your camera and go off of mute. There she is. All right. So we'll bring her on the screen. Look, it's Andrea Inception. <laughs> hey, Aaron. Thanks for the presentation. I really appreciate it. Yeah, um, I love how you kind of you kind of talked about like, hey, I wish, you know, drilling completions were more on the same page from the design of the well. Um, and I, I liked your story about AFEs. On the flip side of that, as a drilling engineer, if you get an AFE um, that was planned for sleeves, uh, but they are they going to do plug and perf? It's like it's like a bonus. Like you're like, oh, yeah, I'm always going to be under AFE right on this well. Right. Uh, but my question is, um, what are kind of the top things that you think drilling and completions engineers are just not on the same page about? Is it the well bore quality? Like, like what, what, what do you think are those top, top items? Uh, it definitely used to be well bore quality. I still remember going out into the Bakken on a, on a drilling rig and uh, it was pretty funny. Uh, it was a, a very uh, profanity laced rant <laughs> from a, uh, he was actually an HSE slash um, uh, what else was his job out there? Anyway, Basically, the operator had, uh, and this was, keep in mind, this was 2008, right? So horizontal drilling, especially in the Bakken, was brand new. And they, they had started uh, really kind of getting it under control. And then they changed their objective. Their drilling bonus was based on how quickly they finished the lateral. So they made that bonus, but the well, oh, it was a train wreck. And so this guy comes out to location on this profanity-fueled rant, uh, calling everybody just, it, it was unbelievable. It was pretty funny. But um but he's like, all right, here's the deal. We're changing it now. It is still based on how quickly you drill the lateral, but it has to be within this certain range. I forget exactly what it was. He said, if you miss that range, no bonus, period. So keep up the good work as far as the straightness of the well or the timing of the well, but get it to be a lot straighter than what it is. So I, I think to a certain extent, that really has been solved over the years. Uh, you know, kind of my example from the Marcellus, when they decided to cut corners on directional drilling. They paid the price. They ended up paying more for it. Um, I think, let's see. I think one of the biggest things is um, definitely kind of just the wellbore construction and, and rightfully so, right? I mean, it, it makes economic sense. It makes, uh, you know, sense for the drilling engineers, for their budgets and their bonuses and things like that. Uh, so I, I don't really see that it's a necessarily completions and uh, drilling, it's upper management, right? That, I think that one kind of has to be funneled downward uh, because, you know, another story, I was talking with a good buddy of mine uh, for a major operator. Uh, he's on the drilling side and I was doing an artificial lift um, study. And I was like, well, what, what happens when you have these undulations in the well and you can't do effective artificial lift? You know, what, what happens then? And he just does a sarcastic laugh and he's like, not my problem. And we just <laughs> fell out laughing. <laughs> and because, but that was the truth, right? That's six months later, nothing to do with them. So they just kind of pass it on. So I, I think drilling, completion, and production really just have to collaborate all the way around. And I think, at least on paper anyway, that's where we start getting better value out of these wells all the way around with these unconventionals. For sure. 100% agree. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Are you sticking around or are you going to leave? I'll drop out. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> Thanks, Andrew. All right, uh, so Michelle's got one. Uh, Aaron, comments or thinking about leaving fluid for an extended period of time within stage before flowing back? Any concerns about damage? Uh, if it's an excessive amount of fluid, then yes, it, there can be concerns. Uh, what we've actually seen, uh, and this is kind of, you know, lear lessons learned, but a lot of times operators do have a shut-in period that they do. And what that allows it to do, the formation closes on the propent and holds it into place better. Because if you just uh, bleed off the pressure right after the frack, the fracture is still kind of open and hasn't held that propent into place yet, then uh, the risk is it sucks it all right back out and now you've lost your conductivity. So, so there's definitely concerns about it. Uh, you know, you have to be... Um, you know, aware of it, not put an excessive amount of fluid out there. But overall, it's kind of generally accepted as a good thing to give it at least a little bit of time for that formation to settle and rest after the frag job. So, as you got another question here, how do we actually measure the quality of fractures? The flow of distance of propent? <laughs> question mark, well, question that's the million dollar question, right? Um, well, no, we're not we're asking any easy ones here today, Aaron. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, the, uh, you know, there's a lot of different techniques, everything from tracers to um, fiber optics, uh, micro seismic can help measure it and, um, <clears throat> and things like that. Now, as far as the quality, that's a very debated issue. Um, the, um, everybody believes different things. Some people like micro seismic, some people like the tracers, some people like all of it. Um, one of the bigger topics, David, you may have had, um, Somebody on talking about the uh, closed well pressure monitoring. I'm, I'm thinking, no. I, Where they're I, offset wells. I, I have a hard time consuming all of the information that I have done on my show. Right, right, right. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if you, if uh, it's a very popular topic right now, a, a pretty quick Google search. And actually go to the SPE magazine, JPT. They've done a lot of articles on it lately. But um, there, that's a big thing now is monitoring with offset wells and um, and the pressure, the what is it called? The closed well pressure monitoring, I think is what it is. But basically they take that offset uh, well, they close it in, and then they read the pressures uh, from the from the well that they're fracturing kind of deal. So Oh, it sounds like something from Cold Bore because we had um, uh, Brett Shell from Cold Bore who had been on the show. That okay. was, oh, that was pre-COVID. Was... Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, and they, they do a lot of measurement and uh, uh, tracking of, of parameters and stuff like that during the frag job. So it wouldn't surprise me at all. Okay. So uh, I, I scrolled back because I remember John DeWar asked this one, and you had mentioned it here. Uh, grateful. If you can describe how fiber optics are used in frac wells. So more specifically, what you were just mentioning, how is fiber optics used uh, in these wells? Yeah, so, so that is pro kind of part of the problem with the um, all of the measuring techniques, right? It, at minimum, they're open for interpretation to a little bit. So <clears throat> the long story short with fiber optics is there's two types of fiber optics that can be used, and that's uh, distributed temperature sensing, DTS, or DAS, which is a distributed acoustic temperature or uh, distributed acu acoustic sensing. And uh, basically, you just run it in uh, on the casing as you're running your completion in the well. And you have to be sure not to perforate into it and uh, over the line. Uh, yeah, it, it can be a little bit challenging. Um, you also, if you're running sleeves, you have to have the certain connections uh, to do it. Uh, but basically, they just sit down in the well bore uh, and they monitor uh, the different temperatures. Uh, so that can, you know, once again, kind of open for interpretation. I've seen it where <clears throat> it's been ran with like the frack sleeve systems and um the, the temperature, you can see the temperature in the stage that you're fracturing cool down because, you know, remember, keep in mind, you're injecting cold temperatures relative to the formation. So you see that stage cool down <clears throat> and then maybe a stage above it cool down as well. And some people like to think, well, that's cement or packers, you know, something's communicating within those stages. Uh, maybe, but it may not be the cement or the packers failing too, right? Because what if it's just the formation connecting above? So... <clears throat> Uh, it can be at minimum open for interpretation with a couple of things there. But so, yeah, that, that would be how you do it is you just leave it in the well <clears throat> and monitor it through the frack job and through the production of the well. So, uh, Gerardo said uh, sealed well bore pressure monitoring. Yes, that's the terminology I was looking for. So, 
thank you for that. Uh, if anybody wants to Google that and check out one of the latest ways that they're monitoring, um, you can find a lot of information on that sealed wellbore pressure monitoring. Thank you for the support there, sir. All right, uh, we did also get the question. What's your thought about simultaneous frack pumping in two wells on same pad in the same time? This yeah, just so makes me think at some point there's going to be three pumping at three at the same time and that it's going to be four. It's going to be like the Gillette razor thing. It's just going to keep adding more and more and more and more. Yes. <laughs> uh, and that is very likely. And actually the three has already happened. Uh, I believe it's Calfrac on their website has a case history where they did three at a time. Um, but yeah, Hal Calfrac, Halliburton, uh, you know, most of the major service uh, companies uh, that pump are starting to talk about this. And so I actually do include it in a lot of my presentations uh, because it is, it's really the zipper fracturing on steroids, um, you know, because now you're fracturing two wells in the same time that you were one well initially. So, so it really could be the next level of surface efficiency with plug and perp. And, you know, it's just kind of like, um, I remember years ago talking with all my drilling colleagues, uh, you know, they were like, oh, we've gotten the wells down to 10 days. There's no way we can possibly get more efficient than that. And the next thing you know, they're drilling them in five days. <laughs> um, I think it's kind of the same thing here, right? It, just when we thought we couldn't get more efficient, well, we may have already gone ahead and done it. So it's, um, <clears throat> it is pretty interesting though, as far as the challenges, um, <clears throat> excuse me, as far as the no challenges. No worries. Yeah, these, the, you know, the crazy Houston weather, the allergies and sinuses and all that stuff. But, um, but yeah, you know, the challenge, or at least in my head, the concern is, you know, you've got the variability in the rock. We're talking about in a plug and perf stage, if you've got three clusters, six clusters, whatever, the variability of the frac distribution through that. And now we're going to take that and do it in two wells. <laughs> um, but, you know, the people I've talked to, it, it seems to be working uh, pretty well overall. So they're, they're loving the uh, overall efficiency gains and seemingly not having too many problems with it. All right, so last question here from uh, Stacey Walker. What is your opinion on entry hole dynamics compared to prop being pumped? Entry hole dynamics. So if I'm understanding the question, I think it's uh, maybe depth don't. penetration. What's that? I said, I don't. Okay, <laughs> uh, so hope, hopefully I'm answering this question correctly. So what I think you're referring to uh, with entry hole dynamics is basically the perforation hole. So um, what I kind of compare this to, or what I, what I always say with these, and, and I'll caution you that most perforation salesmen will argue me on this, but um, anybody outside that's not a little bit biased, I, I think mostly agrees with this. That's kind of, um, it doesn't necessarily, it's not as critical, maybe it's the best way to say it. It's not as critical in unconventionals to have that depth of penetration and things like that. What's critical is you get through the casing and through the cement and, that, and then you apply the hydraulic pressure afterwards. So in a lot of conventional applications, those can be a lot more particular uh, or, or critical because you're not applying the pressures we're applying here. You're acidizing or it's a low pressure frack, things like that. So you are reliant a lot more on perforations in those applications to get further in the well bore. In these applications, once we, you know, we're going to pump at um, 8,000 PSI for two or four, two, three, four hours after that perforation. So it's really just not uh, as critical in unconventional applications. Well, um, on behalf of everybody watching today and everybody watching in the future for this presentation, Aaron, thank you so much. I mean, this has been one of the most informative sessions for me, at least. And I know it's obviously been for a lot of people watching today. Uh, cannot thank you enough and wish you nothing but the uh, utmost success in the future. And hopefully more people uh, now know who you are and know what you have to offer. And hopefully you'll start you know, getting hired on to be able to teach a lot more people in our industry what's actually going on after we get done drilling the well. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's one of those things. After we hit TD and they take the MWD tool uh, out of the BHA, I'm like, I don't care what happens at the right. well now. I'm out of here. Yeah. Uh, so, again, thank you guys so much. Uh, anybody that is watching, if you guys got any more questions, be sure to hit up Aaron. Uh, link up with him on LinkedIn. Uh, follow his YouTube channel. Uh, be sure to go over and visit his website if you're looking to be able to get even more information. Um, this has been absolutely phenomenal. There's tons of great information on his YouTube channel uh, there, like I said. Uh, so next week, I'm not even sure. I've, I've got to confirm there's supposed to be potentially a really cool special shoot that we're going to be doing next week. I need to be able to confirm with 
the person I'm supposed to be doing that with uh, later today. I'll let you guys know. Uh, the week after that is Yoga Shri. Uh, she's going to be teaching us about uh, things that she wished she knew in Reservoir Unconventional, Reservoir Engineering for Unconventionals, something like that. I can't remember the exact title out of it. Uh, June 16th, we're going to have the Managed Pressure Drilling event. So, guys, be sure to uh, stay tuned and be able to check out that. Uh, and that's about it. Uh, any, any last words from you, Aaron? I uh, mean, I just want to give you a shout out. I appreciate you having me on. I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, if for some reason that uh, I pulled in a few connections, be sure to check out the Vidor Locksmith show. It's uh, every Friday, right? Every Friday yeah. at 10 a.m. So, you know, it's just it's important, in my opinion, for completions to understand drilling. Uh, so, you know, this uh, a lot of them are focused on drilling and, and other topics as well. So it's a great resource. So everybody be sure to check out this as well. And yeah, thanks again, David. Appreciate you having me. All right. Well, uh, Aaron, thanks for having been here on the show. It's been absolutely amazing for everybody out there that's watching. Have yourself a wonderful weekend. Uh, go do something fun. Spend some time with your friends and family. And that's it for me. As always, know your industry.